You know, the war in Vietnam was an undeclared war. And the Vietnamese brilliantly uh, wanted to reach out to Americans to educate us about what the war was really about. And um, so I was a community organizer. I'd been an activist in, uh, uh, in Mississippi in the Freedom Summer uh, uh, voter registration campaign. And uh, so Dave Dellinger from Liberation Magazine had put together, was asked to put a delegation together with Tom Hayden to represent the, the range of people that were active in the anti-war movement. And we met with representatives of North Vietnam and the National Liberation Front in Czechoslovakia. And then a smaller group of us was invited to go to North Vietnam to see the impact of American bombing on the North Vietnamese people. And, you know, the American people didn't know anything. What, what weapons, what was the goal of the bombing of villages and hospitals and what weapons were being used? This was all being done with our tax money. Napalm, high concussion bombs, you know, this is what our tax money was being used for. And then we went and saw the sites that were bombed, schools and hospitals and factories and small villages. And so we went on this trip. I was 21 years old. We were the people the Vietnamese were relying on to get their side of the story out. And so we all felt just an enormous responsibility to get as much information as we could and then to bring it back to the American people. And because it was an undeclared war, the government could not punish us from going but they did take away our passports because they said the passports belong to the State Department and the State Department does not recognize North Vietnam. And so they took our passports away. And uh, Tom Hayden, who had been to Vietnam before, um, wanted to visit uh, the POWs and the Vietnamese wanted us to visit the POWs because our government was saying that they were torturing POWs. And um, so uh, we went and met with them, a very difficult meeting. They were in their striped pajama prison suits. We were guests of the Vietnamese government. Uh, we were mostly young, uh, um, not experienced in diplomacy, not aligned with the military in our own country. Um, and, uh, we tried to figure out who we were in relationship to them and to the Vietnamese, uh, hosts. Uh, but we did see that, um, people were given medical care. The first person we met with had been shot down about two weeks before and was in a cast. I think you mentioned in the book that it was very complicated to meet POWs as a guest of the Vietnamese and get any sense of whether, of how they felt about the war. Hmm. Uh, hmm. And, you know, it was a very unequal situation. They were prisoners and we were guests. And uh, who did, you know, who did they think we were? Hmm. So uh, I, I think for us, it was very clear that there were people who were getting well fed, that they were getting medical care, they weren't being brutalized. But for us to judge what their attitudes were about the war, for one thing, was really not our job. Our job was to get the US out of Vietnam, <laughs> not to try to, you know, figure out this nest of accusations and lies and hmm. um, but it, it was very complex so I would I loved reading Tom your stories about your dad what he was able to do under those circumstances and how he held on to his principles and his beliefs it is really remarkable we met three POWs and the first was uh Elmo Leonard, who was injured, and we didn't really engage with him except to just wish him well and take letters from his families and uh, 
really at the direction of the Vietnamese, not that, that they felt that he was in very fragile shape. And then Kerrigan was the adult who really talked a lot about politics. And then Hegdal was this kid, this um, a sailor who he didn't know where he was or who he was. Um, but Kerrigan, he was so adamant. And uh, yeah, it wasn't so much brainwashed the, what I what um, what we thought, at least I thought, was that he wanted to get good treatment, and if he said the wrong thing, maybe he would get punished for it, both by the Vietnamese and by the U.S. And then we met with um, Hegdal, who was a a Navy sailor who had fallen off a Seventh Fleet ship and was rescued by a Vietnamese fisherman. And he, the Vietnamese told us he was treated differently. He could walk around Hanoi. They didn't consider him an enemy of their people the way they did consider the pilots as professional soldiers who knew what they were bombing. And they had a very different feeling about the, the pilots. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was a very complicated experience. I could go on, but it's uh, the whole issue is so complex. They've got prisons back in the States, too. Don't quote, he said, don't quote me uh, on that, on, on, on his having changed his mind on the war. He said, don't quote me on that because they've got prisons there. And when I read that, I thought, oh, my God. It was very confusing, and our delegation had a lot of arguments about what was really going on in this discussion, and, uh, and, and it was a very difficult discussion with the Vietnamese, so uh, very sensitive. In, in terms of communicating with the Americans, American people when we came back, uh, I had borrowed $1,200 to make this trip, and I had to earn the money to pay it back. And I spoke hundreds of places. Sometimes I'd get ten dollars or twenty-five dollars from a church or a school. Really? I spoke to hundreds and hundreds of groups. Uh, I was interviewed a couple of times. Uh, the media was not that interested in what we had done, mm -hmm. and um, and I got hounded by right-wing groups uh, about you know having traveled, and I lost a job over it. The FBI visited my employer and said I was the second most dangerous person in the state of Illinois. <laughs> wow. Who was the first? I don't know. <laughs> I've always wanted to know. Al Capone. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm.